Well, before I get into the Word, I just want to take a moment. Uh, many of you, if not all of you, were involved in our VBS this year. Uh, we had such an incredible time, and I want to take a moment publicly to thank each of you. I know that a lot of you were hands-on. I think we had 50-plus volunteers actually come and do something, whether it's decorating, whether it's teaching, bringing the kids around, doing games, teach, uh, getting up on the stage, goofy skits, all that kind of stuff, having fun together. And we had just the incredible week of ministry. I think each night we had between 90 and 95 students show up. These students were coming. We didn't, we didn't have any idea where they were even coming from uh, as we, we had 140-something registered. And, and I don't know where they came from. Like, I don't know, but I know where they're coming to. And I know what the word that they received. And I know the seeds that were planted in their lives. And, and I know all that happened not because... Pastor Travis got up here and acted a fool on stage and, and cut up and did all this stuff, but it happened because of your prayers. It happened because you guys covered that for months and months and prayed for it and believed for it and fasted for it. And I, I just, real quick, I want to share uh, some of the testimonies because God was so gracious. Like, with kids, sometimes you don't get to see the fruit real quick. Sometimes. Sometimes God's so gracious that he's like, hey, look at this and just see this and and just talking to our leaders, I know in the, in the one group, Pastor Shannon's group, uh, as she went through the week and she's talking with the kids and we're all doing the same thing, uh, she had a couple kids start having a conversation about, do I need to accept Jesus? Do I need to pray to, to accept him? And, and she just was able to just kind of step in there and say, well, yeah, you have to. Like, didn't preach to them, didn't read scripture to them, just kind of encouraging what the Holy Spirit is doing in their lives. And the one little girl Prayed right there with Pastor Chan and gave her life to the Lord, which is amazing. It's awesome. But the little boy didn't pray the prayer. And later on that day, she said she heard him sitting by himself and going, Jesus, would you just come into my heart? I just need you. Without anybody touching him, without anybody praying for him, he just felt that urge of the Holy Spirit that he needed Jesus in his life. And I think in her group, she had three of her kids. I think she only had six in her group. They gave their heart to the Lord. And then the Friday night, which is like the blow me away part, like we're tearing down all the rock walls and all the craziness that we had so that we'd be ready for Father's Day. And mom came to pick up the kid. And what I see is mom at the altar. And mom, through the testimony of her kid, through the testimony of her children coming home and talking about what Jesus was doing, talking about, uh, you know, God is powerful, awesome God, like doing all this kind of stuff, mom's heart was touched. And mom had to see what this was about. And mom had a conversation. And mom gave her heart to the Lord right here in this spot at the altar. Don't tell me Jesus can't do it. Don't tell me he can't do it. Even in our preschoolers, because we did preschool, uh, VBS 2, uh, those little kids, you think that we're just in their babysitting. I, I promise you, over next door, the team is not babysitting your kids. They are ministering to your kids. They are pouring the Holy Spirit into them. They are praying for them. They are, are fasting for these kids. And in our preschool room, uh, I just want to brag on, on Bethany. Bethany Brett was in there, and she's listening, and she's paying attention. And, and JP came up to me the Sunday after, and she, he said, Pastor Travis, I don't know what happened in that preschool room, but every time we ask one of the kids if they want to pray, Bethany's like, I want to pray, I want to pray, I want to pray, I want to pray. And so, like, Bethany has become this prayer warrior. I don't know, how, how old is Bethany now? She's four years old. She's four years old. So, y'all be challenged. Don't let Bethany out pray you because she's going to. Like, she's going to. Like, you better watch out. But, like, God is moving in our kids. And, again, it's without your faithfulness, without your prayers, without your giving, without your support, that can't happen. And so I just want to publicly thank each and every one of you, uh, those of you that worked and, and those of you that just prayed. All of that is vitally important. Uh, and, and we couldn't have done it without you. And so uh, today we're going to be reading out of uh, Daniel chapter 6. And I just feel uh, led by the Lord. If you just stand with me, I want to read our, our main verse. And we're going to pray into today and just kind of get in this study. So if you're able, stand with me for the reading of God's word. We're going to read Daniel 6 verse 10. And it says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in this upper room with the windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before God, before his God, as was his custom since early days. Lord, 
We just thank you for the opportunity to come into your house, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you, Lord. We thank you for showing up already this morning, for breaking chains, Lord, for, sh for being here, Lord God. Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit, Lord, not just to dwell in this place, but to dwell in each one of us this morning. Lord, take this word, Lord God, amplify it in our lives, Lord. Let us receive what you have for us, Lord, that we would be equipped and prepared, Lord God, to go out into our communities, equipped and prepared to minister your gospel, Lord. Let us be you, Lord, to our friends and our families, Lord. Lord, this morning, speak to our hearts, Lord. Lord, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do, and we pray all this in your blessed holy name. You may be seated. And so as I was reading this, this story of Daniel that we're, we're very familiar with, and we'll read some more of it here in a little bit, uh, it made me think back to my days living in Florida. And so I grew up in Ohio, grew up in the north, grew up with bland food, salt and pepper only. Uh, some churches are, are, are King James only. We were salt and pepper only in our house. And so we just, we dealt with it. Now we've been delivered. We have Tony's, we have Frank's, we have Tabasco. I mean, can I, can I get an amen? Like, and so... We've been delivered from that land, and uh, we were sent to Florida, and we were just young and impetuous and had no idea what we were doing, and we're just like, if the Lord says to do it, we're going to do it. And we went and we did it, and we had nobody, nobody there, no friends, no family, just a hope and a prayer and, and doing it. And I, I started to, to think back on all the changes that were in my life rapidly. Like, we moved from Ohio to Florida, climate change, like people change, all this kind of different change in that. And then after our freshman year of college, we decided, you know what would be a great thing to do? Go ahead and get married. So we're going to go ahead and get married. Me and Sunshine are going to get married and then move to Florida. We move to Florida. We get our first apartment, which means first big boy bills, right? And we're starting paying those bills. And then, then we decide, you know what? An apartment's not good enough. Let's buy a house. And so we bought a house. I think I'm like 20 years old at this point. I have no idea why anybody gave me a loan. Like, I, I've no, I had no money, I had no like way of paying, but they were like, here, take these thousands of dollars and live in this house, it's going to be amazing. And we did that, and then God opened this door, we were at the college, we were kind of comfortable there, and God opened this door in Tampa, Florida, and said, here, go and minister at this church. And so I'm like, we're going to go, and it's my first time being on a staff at a church, and that's a whole different ball game, and, and learning all these different personalities, and all these, these different things happening, it's just all this this change and everything. And when I got to the church, I'm like, okay, I have to slow down. I got to learn some people. I got to learn how they do stuff so I don't get myself in trouble, right? And so I met the pastor. And do you know where that pastor was from? He is from Ohio. I'm like, oh, it's my people. I've said it over and over again. A lot of great people come out of Ohio. The rest of them stay. And he came out of Ohio. And I came out of Ohio. And so we must be great people. And he's my people. And so I connected with him. But then like on staff, we had Puerto Ricans and we had Cubans and we had Floridians, which is a whole nother race of people. And like, uh, you know, we had all these personalities that I had to learn and they all operate differently. And, 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 and my, my Hispanic friends, when they got excited, they stopped speaking English. I mean, just words came out. And I'm like, now give me the interpretation because I don't know what you said. And they didn't even realize they switched back. It's just that the excitement and the energy. I mean, they give Pastor Desmond a run for his money. I'm just saying, like, he got it. But so do they. Uh, they got some Cuban food and all that kind of stuff. And I just began observing how they functioned. I began watching how they did things. And then I came across this one young man. His name was Levi Young. And Levi was a different cat. Levi was just a little strange. And, and, and I was like, okay, whatever. I'm a little strange too, I'm sure. You guys would tell me if I was weird, right? Like you would tell me to my face. You wouldn't just like tell me. Just tell me. To, Abby would tell me. She got me. Uh, and so Levi was weird, and I started showing up, because we're driving from Lakeland to Tampa every day to go to work. It's about an hour, hour and a half drive, and, uh, you know, as we're going, we're listening to worship, we're doing whatever. I think our car didn't have air conditioning, so, like, you know, we had two windows down, driving 70 miles an hour is good air conditioning in your face. Your hair's like this when you get there, and it's amazing. And I'd show up at the church, and Levi would be coming, walking out of the sanctuary, What's Levi doing here? Office hours of this and whatever. I'm like, okay, all right. I did that for like a week, and now I'm like, okay, you know what I'm going to do next week? I'm going to show up a little earlier. I'm going to show up just a little bit earlier and see what this Levi guy's doing. Like, why is he at the church? And then he's, he's, he's coming, and, and, and he's sitting there in the front seat, and he's just like listening to some worship. Okay. All right. Did that for about a week, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going I'm to I'm come 
a little earlier and see what's going on. And I, and I see Levi in there just beseeching heaven and just walking and calling fire down and just praying. And, and you would think that there's a whole room of people, but there was nobody there but Levi. And I realized that Levi was so committed to his relationship with his Lord, to the Lord that he was coming an hour to two hours before office hours every day and worshiping and praying and, and seeking the Lord. He's a man after God's own heart. He didn't have a father. His father had abandoned him. It was just him and his mom living at home. And mom wasn't really having the Jesus thing, so he came to church. He didn't have a, a, an upper room. He didn't have a prayer closet. He just come to church and, and didn't know no better and just be blasting the music and the neighbors are getting mad. And, and he didn't care because he's coming after God. And, and I just saw this in Levi, and it challenged me, and it made me want to do better. It made me want to be a, a, a better Christian, it made me want to pray more, it made me want to fast, it made me want to do these things, and, and, and I did, and we became good friends and did youth ministry together for years. He was the junior high pastor, I was a senior high pastor, and it just kind of worked, and I remember we decided we were going to take the youth group to Universal Studios Florida. Can I, can I get an amen? Like, I, I feel, the, feel the glory all over this place, right? And so we would go, and we rented these hotels, and, and again, Pastor Travis was young, and with young comes stupid. And so um, we had this big Cuban kid that was really, really strong. Uh, and and he, he was challenging me because I was a wrestler in high school, right? And you're not, you're not going to challenge me. Like, do you know who I am? Do you know what people I have pinned? Do you know what moves I have made? You don't even understand. Can you smell? Oh, no, no, not that kind of wrestling. It's different kind of wrestling. But we're in the, we're in the hotel room. And I looked at him and I said, let's go. We're going to do this right now. Like, we're done talking. I'm not playing anymore. And I love this move because it was the most painful move to put on somebody. It's called a double grapevine. And so, like, you, you, you get on the person and you've got them locked. And then you take your legs and you wrap them around their legs. And you essentially, like, make it uncomfortable for them so that they say, I quit. Or they push their shoulders to the back of the mat and you get that pin. And I decided, you know what? This will really show William. To really give him what for, and so he'll never run his mouth again. And so I lock my legs in. I've got it in. I am winning. Peter, I'm winning. Like, I am winning. But the problem is, my knee decided to start losing. And soon my, my leg that's supposed to be straight kind of went kink to the side. And, and, and a, a scream, not of praise, but of, of pain, came out of me. And I roll over on that floor, and I am hurt. And I look down at my knee, and my, my kneecap is not here anymore it's kind of like over here someplace like it's not it's not good and and I got to go like Jesse feels me right now and he's all over the place but I I, I got to go to Universal Studios like I got to be the youth pastor I got to do these things and so I cry out for two things in that moment I cry out for Jesus right loud Jesus the whole hotel heard Jesus and I said get Levi and Levi came running into that room, didn't ask what was wrong. He knew there was pain. He put his hand on my knee and started praying. I felt fire. I felt warmth on my knee. He prayed down heaven. And I'm telling you, I've never had my knee worked on. I've never had surgery. I have pain every once in a while. It pops a lot. Like every time I turn, as I'm walking up here, it's popped about 16 times already. But that knee was healed. That... I had faith, but I knew the heart of my friend. I knew who Levi was. See, the loyalty in the secret place created faith for that day in Levi. Like, in the secret place, just going after God and being loyal to him created faith in Levi. Our intimate encounters with the living God will drive you to do what others can't do. An intimate encounter with God will drive you to do the things that other people will not do. And I believe that Daniel was one of these men, that Daniel did things that other men couldn't do. And so I want to read chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, and kind of get into this this morning. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to chapter 6, we'll read verses 1 through 11. We'll talk about the rest of the chapter, but just for time, I won't do it all today. It says, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the other governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. 
And the king gave thought to set, setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and the satraps sought to, to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So these governors and satraps throng before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors, and advisors have consulted together and established a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And so King Darius is here. He's the new king. Uh, he, 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 I don't know how long he had been in, on the throne at this point, but he is setting up his government. He's setting up his leadership. He's a different leader from Nebuchadnezzar because Nebuchadnezzar was the man. Nebuchadnezzar was by himself. He was a, a, a lone soldier by himself. Like everything that he said he did, there was no checks, there was no balances. It was Neb, King Nebi. And uh, we got to King Darius now, and he has a different kingdom. And so they spread out the, uh, the leadership. And so he takes 120 men, he puts them over all the provinces, he sets them up, he gives them some authority, and then he chooses three. Of those three is Daniel. Now remember who Daniel is. Daniel is not his people. Daniel is a foreigner. Da Daniel is a stranger. Daniel is a pilgrim to this place. Like He is not one of them, but yet he's chosen to be there, and, and he's put there. Now, it says that in verse 4 that he is found faithful with no fault. Another word for faithful is loyal. Daniel had been found loyal. He had found no fault. Daniel at this point had probably been serving in the kingdom in this area for over 50 years. I'm not 50 yet. I'm working on it. And I'm 40 right now. I'll be 41 at the end of August. And you know, I don't think it could be said of me even working in a job. Like, I know we've all sinned. It's not saying that Daniel didn't sin. Don't, don't hear what it's not saying. Daniel was a man. But as far as him working and doing his responsibilities and taking care of business, they could not find fault. They could not find error. They could not find where he, he shorted something or he skirted something or he, he went and just didn't do quite enough because he was tired that day and 4 o'clock's coming and i got to punch out the office. There was no fault. There was no error. He was completely loyal to the task that was given him. And they wanted to find, their, their whole purpose was they were jealous of Daniel. They wanted to take him out, and they were just trying to find one error. And then you know that these people, you know, don't raise your hand, but all of us know a petty person, right? All of us know somebody that they'll find the smallest little thing that you've done wrong. The littlest thing you said, one word wrong, and they're like, but you said this. And they point it out, and they want to, like, make it a big deal, right? These are those people. They're looking for one little minute thing that he could have fault, and they could not find it. Could not find it in him. But understand how difficult that would have been for Daniel under the circumstances. Daniel was probably 15, 16 years old when he was taken from his homeland, taken as a slave to work in the king's court under King Nebuchadnezzar. He's brought there as a foreigner, and they say, hey, Daniel, we love that name Daniel. Daniel's great, but we have a better name. And they change his name. They give him a Babylonian name because they want to make him Babylonian. And then they put him in a school, right? Free school. Free school sounds great. As long as it's free, it's for me, right? And they put him in school for three years to train him up in their ways. And he goes, and he learns. He doesn't fight it. He doesn't get a picket sign. He doesn't walk the street and say, I will not go to school. Because 
He just, he just didn't do it. He said, okay, I'll do this. But there are things that we saw that he said no to. He said, I will not eat the king's meat. I will not do that. I will not bow to false idols. I will not. He, he drew some lines, but when he could walk in agreement with the government, he walked in agreement with the government while representing his God that was not there. Or at least they thought he was. And so he's taught in this foreign school, and he's taught in the thing, and the leaders, uh, you know, try to, to manipulate him. He had served under multiple people at this point, at least uh, two or three different kings that he had been under at this point, and he's on, like, his next king, and yet there is no fault to be found. And so what do the people do? They turn and they say, let's attack, let's attack God's law, because we know where Daniel's loyalty lies, and it lies with his Lord, and we will attack his laws, because then, then we will find fault in Daniel. That's what they do. And so they come up with this plan, and they, they concoct it, and they go, and, and it begins with lies, right? If you look in verse 7, verse 7, they begin, and they say, all the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors, and advisors have consulted together and established a royal statute to make a firm decree that whoever petitions, said all, every last one of us, we're all in agreement. I think that they forgot to call Daniel that day. Because I don't think that Daniel would have been in agreement with this statute. But they got to get the king on their side, and so they, they appeal to him, look, your whole king lived forever. King, you are amazing. King, all of your chosen people, because you are amazing, have said that this is good, so it is good. And they appealed to his vanity. King, oh, king, oh, there's never been a king like you, king. You know, king, king, mighty king. Why don't you put two crowns on king? Like, you are great king. Like, they're making him feel good and be like, why would anybody worship anybody but who you tell them to worship? Because you are mighty. You are powerful. You are great. And he's like, I am kind of great. Give me that paper. I want to sign it. And he signs it and does what he really is going to regret later. And, and we know that, that they tricked and they found and they looked for Daniel and they got him. And that story goes on, you know, that the, that the king is... Is, is troubled, he's beside himself when he, because he, you know, he doesn't want this to happen, and, and, he, and he, he's trying to figure out a way to get out of it, and, and brings Daniel, puts him in the lion's den. Uh, the funniest part of the story, we're not reading this part, but I, I really love when, when King Darius gets up in the morning and runs to the lion's den. A, why are you running? Because he's either dead or he's not. Like, he's been there all night. Like, why wake up, have a slow morning, read your Bible, eat some eggs and bacon, like, get there when you get, like, it's going to be what it's going to be, King. But he runs there, he's concerned for Daniel, and he gets there, and he cries out, and he's like, Daniel, has your Lord saved you? And when I, when I see this in my head, I, I like, I, the Bible, when I read it, it's like a movie in my head, and, and I'm like, I can just see Daniel waiting a moment. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm good, King, I'm here, because you know, I mean, that's what I would do. I'd be like, just give a little pause and be like, oh, no, it's okay. It's fine. And so it has nothing to do with our story today. I just think it's funny, and that's how I see the Bible, and so uh, it's okay. Uh, but loyalty to God produces an unwavering faith. When we're loyal to God, we, we, our faith doesn't waver. It doesn't move left or right or up or down. It, it's, it's there. We have faith. We know who we know because we're loyal to him who is loyal to us. And so I think there's three lessons that we can learn from Daniel's life here in this passage today. The first one is Daniel didn't walk alone. Daniel didn't walk alone. Seems like he's alone. A lot of the stories just talk about Daniel, but Daniel did not walk alone. He had people with him. See, when he was first taken, we don't know how many people were taken, how many of these young men that were of good stature, that were strong, that looked like people that could work in the kingdom. We don't know how many men were taken. We know that there was four, at least. But there could have been 10, there could have been 20, there could have been 100. I don't know. But there was other men taken from his people, and he would have known those people. But these four friends were together. You know, you had Daniel, you had Hananiah, you had Mishael, and Azariah, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we all know them as. And so in Daniel chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, we see this. So Daniel chapter 2 Verses 17 and 18, it says, Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, 
Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. See, the pressure that's happening right now is that, that um, the king had had a dream. And the king didn't trust people. He had, he had trust issues, and, and, and instead of telling his, his people, his magicians, his astrologers, all these people that he trusted, instead of saying, hey, interpret this dream, let me tell you what the dream is, he says, no, you tell me the dream, and you tell me the interpretation. And, 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 and he, he's not a good king. Like, he's wicked, he's evil, he, he is malicious, and he will take out anybody and does not care about it because he considers himself a god. And so in that moment, of course, they try to explain to him, hey, this can't be done. And he's like, okay, well, then I don't need you. Kill them. It's literally what he does. And, the, and his people start going out, and they're just they're killing them, just taking them out, taking out the wise men. Because the king's like, if you can't tell me this, then you're not really wise, so I don't really need unwise men, so just kill all the wise men. I'll be better off on my own. And when they show up at Daniel's house, we read it, and sometimes we think that this is not, this is somebody just kind of talking to Daniel. No, this was the executioner showing up at Daniel's doorstep saying, you're next, buddy. And Daniel has the faith and the loyalty and this built up with God that he, he says, well, if you would just give me a chance, I will beseech my God, and he will tell me, and I will, I will interpret it. Now, you would think that that's just a, a, a no-lose situation for Daniel because he's going to die either way, right? But no, understand the pressures that are happening here. Like He, he is going to die either way if he's wrong or if he can't interpret it, or if he just says nothing, he's going to die. But he puts a little hope in God. He says, God will show me. God will do this for me. He'll give me that. But if he goes and he gives a wrong interpretation, can't get the interpretation, his death is going to be worse because this king is going to torture him. It's going to be a slow death. It's going to be a painful death. And so he's putting a lot on the line here to, to stand for God. And when he gets the permission, he doesn't just go into his prayer closet by himself. He doesn't just just pray a simple prayer and be like, okay, God, now show me. Write it on the, on the whiteboard for me, and I can get it. No, he grabs his buddies, and he says, look, we have to go after God together. Like, we're going to go after the throne room. We're going to go after his voice because we have to hear. He, he will speak. We know that he will speak. There's a word in here that it says, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven. They might seek. That original word it does mean to search, to find, to look for, but like, have you ever, I, I'm kind of short, some of you tall people won't understand this, but we'll, we'll explain it to you later, but have you ever reached for something on a high shelf, and you can't quite get it, and you're like, ah, ah, and you like just, I mean, it's like you just want another inch, and it's like if you just stretch enough, it's like you can almost get there, right? Use that image when we're saying the word seek here. There's stretching towards God. We're reaching towards heaven. We are going after the thing that we cannot get because we have to have it. And him and his friends are there, and I can just see them just beseeching heaven and on their knees and prostrate and just praying and saying, God, speak. God, speak. Some scholars would say later on that God only spoke to Daniel because Daniel says he gave me the revelation. I don't believe that. I think he gave all four of them the revelation at the same time. And that they confirmed that. Because I don't think Daniel would walk into that king's court just going on his own. That the other ones gave and there was corroboration and they were, they were unified. They were together and they gave the right interpretation to him. He wasn't alone. He had companions. He had friends. He also had the spirit. Look, in Daniel 5, verse 11, an interesting thing is happening here. And there's this party going on, right? And... Uh, the new, the new king, Belshazzar, is here, and he decides their, their, their whole kingdom, the Babylonian kingdom, is under siege. The Medes and the Persians are coming. There's fighting going on outside the city. They can probably hear it. Really, at this time, it's believed that there's two kings, that Belshazzar was the number two king, and the number one king was out in battle, and he probably died in this battle. And so the, the right thing, the logical thing to do is, Let's set in our kingdom, in our court, in our palace, and let's have a party. Let's have a party because we're about to get destroyed. Just to show, like, we're not afraid of you. You can't come and get us. I can get into so much more with that. But, like, just the arrogance is there. And it goes beyond that because then if you read in that chapter, in chapter 5, it says that he sends for all of the, the uh, Jewish uh, gold and silver items that had been taken from their temple, and he begins to drink out of them. 
to dishonor God. Like the boldness that is in this guy, and as he's, as he's drinking, as he's in this drunken stupor, a finger, a hand appears and writes on the wall. That'll sober you up. I mean, I've not seen it happen, but I'm telling you, I'd be paying attention real quick. A hand just, I don't know what that hand looked like. I don't know if it was like, I don't know. I don't know if it just dissipated, but it was there and it wrote on the wall. He didn't know what it said. He called in his wise men, tell me what it says. They're like, they don't know what it says. They may have known what it says, but they were scared to tell him. I don't know. But then comes our verse here in verse 11. And it says, there's a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father's the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Understand who's talking to him. This is the queen mother. This is Nebuchadnezzar's wife that's speaking to him. This is her grandson. She's coming in. Hey, little boy, you've not paid attention. You're fighting. You're drinking. You're doing all this, and you can't understand. Like, he is moved by the power of God. This king is moved by the power of God. It says that his knees were knocking. Like, it wasn't clapping you were here, and that was his knees coming together. He was so afraid of what was happening, but had no idea what it, it said. But she recognized and spoke it to him that the spirit of the living God is inside of this man. You're looking for all these others. They don't have what Daniel has. Daniel is full of God's spirit. Daniel has heard from God. Daniel has been accurate for God. God uses Daniel. They recognize the spirit. Now, how, how this, this king didn't know about him, he surely had heard stories, but he hadn't seen the fullness of how God works in him. And if that's not enough, in, in Daniel uh, 6.3, says this Daniel distinguished, distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. Daniel wasn't alone. He was in a foreign land. He was a refugee. He was away from all the things that he knew his family, but he was not alone. He had his friends, and he had the spirit of a living God in him. We have access to that same. We have access to that spirit. Why would you walk alone? Why would you face the battles alone? Look, Acts 1.8 says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Like, don't tell me that this was like, this felt like the ends of the earth to Daniel, but he had the Spirit of God in him. And so yet he knew he wasn't alone. And so he could stand in that boldness, so he could do those things because he was loyal to a living God. He didn't become loyal to the things around him. The second thing that I think we can learn from Daniel is that the Daniel, that uh, our loyalty will revert will reveal our location. Our loyalty will reveal our location. And so these people set up a test for Daniel's loyalty, and they knew what his pattern was. They knew that he prayed. In fact, our, our scripture says that he prayed three times that day, that he kneeled, that he faced Jerusalem. I, I, did, I, I researched Jerusalem this way, if you guys wondered. It's, it's out that door. I, I did the map. Uh, just had to know. It bothered me. Um, and... He faced Jerusalem with his door open, prayed three times that day, and then at the end of that verse it says, as was his custom. Daniel didn't do anything different. He heard what was said, he knew what it meant, and he continued to be loyal to his God. See, Daniel loved the king. The king and him were good. They had a good relationship. He didn't want to dishonor the king, but he didn't want to dishonor God. And when you've got to choose between man and God, you know, if you're taking notes, always choose God. I mean, just in case you're taking notes, choose God. That's the right answer. That'll get you the, the correct, you get 100% on your, your test. And he chose God here. And it seems like an impossibly difficult situation for Daniel. But Daniel knew that the safest thing he could do was be completely loyal to a loyal God in this situation. Maybe it's our perception of power that changes our loyalty. Maybe it's how we view people and how we give them power, how we give them authority, how we say, oh, man, if I, if I don't do that, then I might get fired. I might not have a job. Oh, if I, if I do that, they might lock me up. 
I might have to go to jail. Like, they're going to take my Bible, and, 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 and I might not be able to drive the car that I want. I may not be able to do these things. So that person has power, and I should do what they tell me to do. But maybe it's our perception of power that messes up what's happening. Because ultimately, there's one person that has the power, and that's God. There's one person that has the authority, and that's God. But we get this perception that we have to serve man, that we have to give him what he wants, because give Caesar what Caesar's, and you do obey, and you do follow the government. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not telling you guys to go out and like start riots, but serve an almighty God that's powerful enough to open doors that you could lead somebody like King Nebuchadnezzar to a faith. What did, what did Daniel do? Did he, did he get a picket sign? Did he say, I hate Nebuchadnezzar. Down goes Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is the Antichrist. He might have been. He seemed like it. He was a wicked man. As I was reading, they would say that as he would conquer kings, he would bring you in as a king, stand you in his court and bring in your sons and murder your sons right in front of you. And then he would gouge out your eyes and let you live the rest of your life with the lasting image of your sons being murdered in front of you. That's King Nebuchadnezzar. If you're not reading the scripture that way, go back and read it again. But I know at the end of his life that he bowed before the Lord. Why? Because Daniel's perception of people wasn't their authority. He knew who had authority. He knew who God was. He knew that this was the one that he had to serve. He knew that there was no other, that there was nothing else. Our loyalty reveals our location. When they, when they came to find him, these other governors didn't have to search very long. It's one verse. It says Daniel prayed three times, as was his custom. The next verse, verse 11. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplications before his God. He knew, and they knew. Not only did his loyalty reveal his physical location, but his, his loyalty revealed his spiritual location. He understood, and people knew where he was at. There was no questioning. They're like, does Daniel really love God? You know, like, does, does Daniel just talk about God, and then he goes home, and he just chills out, and he doesn't read his Bible, he doesn't pray, he doesn't do any of these things? There was no question of that. Daniel's loyalty revealed his location. Not only did the men know where to find him, but you know who else knew where to find him? God. God didn't have to search. I, can, I see this image. Pastor Darrell referenced Genesis today. Like, I see this image of God walking through the garden and being like, where are you at, Adam? Are you hiding from me? God knew where he was at, but he asked. I don't think God walked through Daniel's house and been like, where are you? In the lion's den, Daniel, where are you at? Are you here? Are you? He knew where he was at. His loyalty revealed the location of where Daniel was at, where his heart was at, where his physical was at. They knew where he was at. But he postured himself. He didn't just take it lightly. Three times a day, postured himself. It's very specific in the words. It says that he kneeled, that he went in front of his window. He kneeled, he faced Jerusalem, he opened the windows, and he prayed unto God. I'm not saying you need to pray towards Jerusalem. But the reason he prayed towards Jerusalem is because he knew that's where the sacrifices were offered that covered the sin that they were dealing with. And in, I believe it's 1 Kings talks about, like, pray to where the offering is given. And he just did what he knew. Some would say that he, it seems aus, out, out, outlandish that he would open his windows, that he was just calling, he was asking for it. His windows probably opened to an inner core that nobody else had access to. He wasn't praying to man. Praying to God, he postured himself. How many times have we refused to posture ourselves because we don't want to look silly? We don't want to look stupid. There's four ways, really, we posture ourselves to pray in front of God. We'll kneel. Some will stand with arms raised. That looks stupid. Right? Like, just do that in Walmart. See what happens. <laughs> Almighty God, get this dude out. We lay prostrate. And I know that we can, see, we can be seated because it says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. Has there been a time where God said, hey, 
would you position yourself towards me? And you're like, ah, I don't want to look silly. Stop that. I feel dumb. It's okay. I'm introverted. Like, the fact that I'm up here preaching is ridiculous. Like, this is not, like, no. But I can tell you, today, even during worship, being at camp with, with the students at YFN, Pastor Travis may have jumped a little bit. He may have waved his arms around now. He might have shouted out loud. I know that there was a time where the, whoever was preaching at the time, they said, hey, can we, can we honor the Lord? Can we praise the Lord for a little bit? Pastor Darrell did that a little bit, hyped us up. Hey, can we make some noise? Can we call out to the Lord? And these students started calling out to the Lord, and I thought, oh, they're going to give us 30 seconds. They might give a minute if they're super spiritual, right? Because, like, it's hard. Like, I'm telling you what Pastor Darrell does up here. It ain't easy. He makes it look easy, but he gets you guys going. These students screamed at the top of their lungs to the Lord for seven minutes. It didn't go down. It stayed here for seven minutes. And you could feel God's presence just hovering in that place and speaking to lives. Would you posture yourself in a place where they, God will know where you're at, that man will know where you're at. Your loyalty reveals your location. The last thing I think we see from Daniel's life is loyalty is built in the patterns of pursuit. See, Darius wanted to save Daniel. Darius was distraught. It said he, he, he searched for ways to save Daniel until evening. And, and you know that these governors and these satraps and all these officials were getting frustrated because their goal was just to take Daniel out so that they could have his position. And they come to him in the evening and they say, hey, reminder, king, the Medes and the Persians, once the law is, is put into place, it cannot be undone. It is here. And you signed it. You signed it. You signed it. I see your name. You did it. Go get Daniel. His heart was broken. This is his friend. He didn't want to go get Daniel. He sends for Daniel, and he brings, he brings Daniel out and puts Daniel in the lion's den. But as he puts him in, he says something to him. As he puts him in, he, he says, Daniel, but I know that your God can save you. I know that your God can save you. And he had a little bit of faith, and he sealed the stone that they put with his ring. Some would say that they sealed that, that stone that Daniel couldn't get out. I think he sealed that stone that others couldn't get in, that, that God would get all the glory for this miracle. It was sealed. So no one was in, no one was out. So if he's alive, it's only God. It's very similar to Jesus with the stone rolled in front of the tomb and the guard put there. No man could take Jesus out. It was God alone. And he goes to him, and, and, he, and he shows up that, that morning and, and sees that, that he is there. See, the thing that you have to understand, though, is because we're all going to face trials and difficulties and, 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 and situations in our life. If you haven't faced something difficult yet, I'm sorry. I hate to be the one to tell you. It's coming. It's coming. It's life. You shouldn't be bothered by it. We serve a living God that's going to be there with you. But if we just wait until we're in that trial to start asking God to help, we may have been a little too late. See, Daniel didn't start praying in the lion's den. Daniel continued praying in the lion's den. I don't think you understood that. Like, Daniel didn't start praying in the lion's den. He continued praying in the lion's den. Daniel was like 84 years old at this point. It's a good age. Amen. But I don't think anybody that's 24 years old wants to be in a lion's den. Like, at 84, I mean, it's like there was no hope except for God. Because he had had a pattern of prayer in his life. It says, as was his custom. This wasn't something new. Oh, the, the king made an edict. Let's get on our knees and pray. It should be, man. The government, that this, that this happened. Let's continue to be on our knees and pray. Let's continue to pray. Let's pray with fervency. Let's pray with purpose. But let's continue this pattern of prayer in our lives. Daniel didn't wait till he's in the Daniel in, in the lion's den to begin praying. So our faith is built in a secret place in these patterns of pursuit. 
It's, it's when I'm on my knees and nobody's around. It's all, when I'm on my knees and I'm with a, a few of my friends and when I'm seeking God and God begins to speak to me that my faith is just raised. That a day or two or a week or whatever later and something hits and I'm like, <laughs> look, quick testimony. I know we're late on time. I'm sorry. Uh, but God's not, so whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, recently I was given, and I, I didn't get permission. Can I share this? Like, is it okay? Okay, all right. She did this, so that means okay. You know, we're pregnant with our ninth child. That's exciting and all this. And we went to the doctor. We got the, the whole gender reveal, all this kind of stuff. I won't tell you the gender because then she really will be mad at me. But, um, but I can tell you for a price, I'll tell you. Just bring me off. Um, and, and everything's good on the ultrasound. And I leave to come back to work. And she messaged me later. And she says, hey, they found some spots on the heart. And I, and I went from like, ha, ah, to who. Oh. And so we went to go get some blood work done to see what it is. And the blood work came back. So I, I, I'm a man of faith. I think the blood work's going to come back and say, hey, it's not this minor thing. It's just this little heart deal. It's going to be, it's going to be fine. It's pretty normal. They came back and they said, we, we think that there's a chance that the, the baby has Down syndrome. And so I'm like, okay. What do I do with this? And I begin to pray. And it was two weeks ago that Pastor Joe said, you know, either God is sovereign or he's not. There's no in-between. He's not sovereign on Tuesdays and not on Wednesdays. Like, he's either sovereign or he's not. And I just, it, it resided in my spirit. And I said, okay, God, this baby's in your hand. Can I tell you that the blood work came back 99.9% .9 that he does not have uh, Down syndrome, that the baby does not have Down syndrome? Like, that, I believe, I told Sunshine this the other day, I said, I think that the baby did. I think that the baby did. But then I think that the baby didn't. I'll never know, but I think that the baby did. And that the baby didn't. It's, it's that faith, it's that prayer that you have to have. You can't stand, if you can't stand for God in a time where there's no test, how are you going to stand for God when there's a time of test? When it's easy to read your Bible, when no police officer is coming and ripping this out of your hand, if you can't read it then, what makes you think you'll read it when you're not allowed to? Because you won't. If you can't pray now, why will you pray then? That's a prayer of desperation. That's not a prayer of faith. I want to pray prayers of faith. We're supposed to seek him. Look, Proverbs 8, 17 says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me find me. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Matthew 7, 7 and 8 says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open for you. For everyone who asks receives, and to him who knocks, it will be open. And so I'll close with this. While we're at YFN on Tuesday in, in worship, God just gave me this, this vision. And that's typically how God speaks to me. I was really striving. I really, really wanted to see something. And when I relaxed myself, then God gave me this vision. And I saw myself in heaven. And I saw this figure standing. There's just this giant figure. I couldn't even see its head. I could see up about to its chest. And it was standing there with its feet apart and holding a, a, a sword. I still don't have full revelation of what all this means. I'm just going to share it with you guys. So I see that, and I'm transported back here to earth, and everything is dark. I see a diner out in the, the, the distance. I'm outside. I, can, I, can, I know that it's, it's um, you know, and I, and, I, and I start to see these searchlights, kind of like when you'd see at a, a car lot when they're searching the sky and draw you in, but they're coming down. And these lights are blue, and the light comes in and finds me. And when it shines on me, I hear this voice, and it says, will you go? And of course, I'm like, yes. And I know it's the Lord. I'm like, yes, Lord, whatever you need, I will go. I will go, whatever you need. And immediately my body is consumed in fire. I can't see myself anymore. It's just a, it's just a ball of fire, and it's, it's raging, and it's burning. And, and I realize that it's burning out things that are in me that need to be gone, things that are deep down, things that are rooted that I've fought with for years. They said, if you would serve me, if you would be loyal to me, if you would say yes to my yes, and no to my no, I will burn these things out of you. I will take them out of you. I'll fill you. I'll consume you with my spirit so that you may be used. And then I saw this fire walking into a building, and people were, were drawn to it. I don't think it's me at this point, but it is. And they see the fire, and they see the light, and they smell the flame, and they're drawn to it, and they come, and they, they begin to, to, to draw close to it because they want it. They want this in their own life. And then all of a sudden, I'm clothed in white. But my head and my hands are still fire. 
I had no idea what this meant when he told me, but I'm like super excited. Miss Margaret, I might have been doing backflips. Like, I'm excited. You know, Hebrews 12, 29 says, or 28 and 29 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. I feel today we have an opportunity to respond to God's word, that we have an opportunity that maybe your life's not where you want it right now. Maybe when you look at Daniel, you're like, I don't meet up to Daniel. Like, maybe I'm not doing the things that I'm supposed to do. Maybe I've allowed things to creep in. Maybe I've allowed people to take places and authority in my life that they're never supposed to have authority. And today is the day that I want to remove all of that. Today is the day, and altar team, you can make your way up. Today, I want to, to give my allegiance of loyalty fully to God. Friends, I believe that we're in revival. And I believe for us to foster revival, we have got to get on our knees. We have got to pray. We have got to fast. We have got to seek the Lord. We have to have our loyalty unshaken, unwavered, because there's a battle waging around us that you cannot see. But it's happening. If these teenagers at YFN can run to the altar, that they can go and they can let go of things in their life and allow God to restore their life, surely we can do the same thing. As I watch teenagers walk up with, with drugs and with razors and with all kinds of different things in their pockets and throw them on the stage and say, God, I'm done to that. Not for now, but take it out of me. Burn it out of me. Burn it to the core that there's nothing left and fill it with your spirit. Today, you have that opportunity, if you'd stand with me. If that's you today, that you want to get yourself to a better place, you want to, to, to take this challenge, God, I am going to make a serious, concerted effort to be loyal to you, that I am going to be like this Levi, that I'm going to pray, that I'm going to search after you, that I'm going to give you all these things, that I'm not going to give authority to man, I'm not going to give authority to money, I'm not going to give authority to things, I'm going to give authority to you and only you that you can use me as an instrument of special use. As the worship team begins to play, if that's you, and we're not going to rush this. I know it's after 12. If you got to go, go. But we're going to let God do what he wants to do here. Because the song they're about to play, it says, burn like a fire. That's what we're inviting. God, burn like a fire. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Burn out the world. I want to be so full of the Holy Spirit. That's been my prayer every day since Dr. Mwenya was here. It's like, God, fill me so much with the Spirit that people don't see me. Because I have nothing to offer this world. And I don't want to leave room for anything else to come in to manipulate that and change it. If that's you, if that's what you want, I want you to make your way to this altar right now. I want you to worship God. I want you to come to these workers and pray. Would you come?
Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Oh, shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. And Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. continue in this vein. We're going to leave the altars open. We're going to continue to, to seek after God, to, to pledge our loyalty, to, to, to just ask Him to fill us. But I'm reminded of the story of King Nebuchadnezzar at the end. And as he lost his mind, as he went crazy for seven years and God put this upon him, he, he, he crawled the earth and he, you know, just was what he was. But when God released him from that, and he arose, and he declared that the Lord is Lord, the first thing he did was he worshiped the Lord, that he thanked God. And so for some of you today, this is a time where you are, you are refreshed, you are renewed, you are, you are rejuvenated. Don't let that go. But you know what? Also, we need to, to worship the Lord. We need to thank him. We need to celebrate him today. Look, we can do that in a couple ways. The worship team is going to sing some more songs here, and we're going to be able to worship if that's you. And even if you didn't respond to the altar, we're going to worship God on our way out. But maybe today was that moment where you feel this urge that you have to respond. Look, Jesus responded in this way. Jesus went through the Jordan. Jesus was baptized in water. If that's you today, and you want to follow the Lord in baptism, we're going to be over here. We'll be ready for you. Just make your way over here and let us know. We, we have the tank full and we're ready to go. But for the rest of us, can we just worship, the God, worship God? Can we give him everything that we have? Holding nothing back. Can we walk out of this place? 
I don't know where you're going to lunch. I don't know if you're going running errands after this. I want people to recognize God in you. I want somebody to look at you strange. I want them to ask you questions because I want them to see the Jesus in you. I want them to see the God in you. I want you to begin to take this revival out of the four walls of this church and take it into your household. I want you to take this revival and bring it into your community. I want you to take this revival and bring it into your businesses. If you just keep it in this four walls, if you just keep it inside of you, you're missing it. Daniel took it wherever he went. People recognized who he was and who was in him. The worship team, you can just bring us back there. And let's just worship God as we close today. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Yes. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. We declare Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name, Jesus. Oh, we declare these words right now, right now. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, yes. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. And Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus, yes, shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, and Jesus for my family, I speak the
Hallelujah. Can we give God some praise in this place? Come. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to continue to worship. The altars are going to remain open, but I, I do want to take the time to close in prayer and release those that need to be released. If you extend your hands to heaven with me. Father, I thank you for your people, God. I thank you for the move of your spirit, God. I thank you that you continue to remind us that you are not done, God. Father, have your way as we go to our homes, as we go to our families, as we go to our workplace, Lord God. I thank you that you don't stay in this place, but you go with us, God. So, Father, have your way in our lives this week. Move mightily, God, wherever our feet may tread. Bless your people coming and going, and may you receive all the glory and honor in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. You are dismissed.